Ohio, a USPS postal worker is possibly facing years in prison after admitting to raking in thousands of dollars from trafficking fentanyl. 31 year old Carrie Beach was caught intercepting packages containing drugs such as fentanyl and meth. Beach was paid $500 per parcel to drop off the packages. He's now charged with mail theft, which can land a USPS employee a five year prison sentence. And this all comes as authorities are trying to grapple, of course, with the growing opioid crisis. Joining us now, a journalist and author who's been tracking fentanyl for decades now, Gerald Posner. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Natasha. Thanks for having me. So we are seeing this postal worker story coming out, but also would love to get your context and insight into another big fentanyl story we've been tracking. Uh, this week, several of the largest retail pharmacy chains announcing that they are settling to resolve thousands of lawsuits over the addiction crisis. So first of all, help us understand, explain why a CVS or a Walgreens would be responsible for the opioid epidemic. You know, a lot of people seem to be surprised. You know, why are pharmacies? Their defense originally was we don't do anything but just dispense the pill that the doctor writes. So if there's a problem, go and talk to the doctors or the manufacturers. But in fact, what they were doing in these instances, CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart, they were they were filling prescriptions that they knew were bad, that they knew were there were so many being filed by doctors questionable prescriptions, prescriptions that were obviously fakes, that what they did, Natasha, is they ended up flooding the market without any controls. In one, two little counties in Ohio with only a few thousand people, they filled 140 million prescriptions over a few years, uh, and they never reported any of that to the DEA or the FDA. As a result, they've had to now settle for $13 billion. That's on top of the $33 billion already agreed to by drug manufacturers like Purdue Pharma and by the distributors who also knew where all the pills were going. So this is some $50 billion that will go to the drug treatment at the local and state level, not directly into the pockets of victims who suffered or lost family members, but to hopefully prevent people in the future from being addicted or getting them a path off of addiction. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, helping to explain that. And we do want to know in the settlement, Walgreens and CVS not making an admission of wrongdoing. Uh, but do you feel, do you view the settlement as progress in the opioid crisis? Yeah, th there's no question that that settlement with the, the major retailers, the pharmaceutical ch chains, uh, the pharmacies, was a step forward because they originally were going to fight it. As a matter of fact, uh, Walgreens and CVS went to court in an Ohio case that we talked about, as a matter of fact, you, you and me on this channel uh, just a few months ago, and they lost that case for $650 million. And that was sort of the instance in which all of the pharmacies uh, uh, then said, okay, we can't go ahead and fight it. There are thousands of lawsuits. If we end up losing them, we're going to pay much more than this. They came up with a figure they put together, and that was a $13 billion. Right. And, and notably, we are showing this other headline that we want to, uh, to get you to weigh in on from the CDC. Uh, they're revamping their guidelines for doctors who prescribe opioids, reacting to their previous recommendation in 2016. Who, and some said that that recommendation was too austere. It led to under-prescribing and under-treating pain. Uh, how do you see this? Do these new guidelines make it easier for doctors to, to prescribe opioids and is that a step in the right direction? Isn't it amazing that after all these years with a lethal opioid crisis, we don't seem to be able to get it right about how to do the prescribing? So originally in the mid-90s, in the early 2000s, um, doctors sort of believed, they were told by Purdue Pharma and other manufacturers, with OxyContin, you can go ahead and prescribe opioids for all types of back pain and everything else. And don't worry, it's not addictive. And then we found out by overprescribing, we had a lethal epidemic. Then in 2016, as you said, the CDC finally gets involved and says, all right, here are some guidelines. We're going to give you the guidelines and go ahead and try to use these. No more than 90 milligrams a day of the equivalent of morphine. Don't keep them on for more than a few weeks. And doctors didn't take that as guidelines or suggestions. States and medical authorities took it as absolute firm figures. And so therefore, all of a sudden, you had people who were on for years treating really terrible pain conditions cut off cold turkey. They had to find other ways of treating their pain. They had difficulty doing it. Doctors prescribed very few opioids. And now there's such a problem with the pendulum having swung too far back. The CDC is trying to find this middle ground. And these new guidelines just issued within the past week literally say to doctors, have some discretion. We're going to trust you to be able to figure out when a patient needs an opioid for chronic pain, first give them non-opioid painkillers. If those don't work, then put them on opioid painkillers, the smallest possible dose, 
for the shortest amount of time. Thank you for watching. Go to newsnationnow.com to find News Nation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.